you know, if you look hard enough, you can find evidence to support almost anything. What do we need to take solid, thoughtful, evidence-based decisions? In the book, I deploy an acronym, SEES, S-E-E-S, to remind us that there are four kinds of information that can really help the decision maker. And the first S is situational awareness. What is actually happening on the ground or in cyberspace? So you can answer factual questions about what, when and where. And you need some pretty reliable information about the situation you're facing before you start arguing about what to do about it. Here, of course, is my first lesson in intelligence. Our knowledge of the world is always incomplete, it's fragmentary, and it's sometimes wrong. And you can't get away from that. Don't expect perfect information, particularly for if you take economics. You're always looking in a rear-view mirror. It may be months before you get the data on which you can then base your assessment on, say, inf interest rates, by which time the situation on the ground may well have changed. Um, your choice of where to look for information can seriously distort <laughs> your overall picture. Um, that's the problem of the internet filter bubble. And of course, rumor, fake news, deliberate deception, all the rest of it. And in the secret intelligence world, of course, there's an awful lot of that. So that, um, that is the, the first part of my acronym, SEAS, which is situational awareness. But, and it's a big but, facts by themselves, even if you're pretty sure of your facts, mean zero unless you've got an explanation for why they came to be the way they are. Even if you've got all the data science and artificial intelligence and all the rest of it. So, a young man is in front of the magistrate's court. He's accused of throwing a bottle at a policeman during a bit of a rammy, and his fingerprints are on the bottle. Open and shut case. No, says the defense lawyer, the bottle belonged to my client. It was sitting in his recycling bin outside his front door. The mob rushed past, picked it up. That's how his fingerprints got on the fragments of the bottle. So same identical forensic fact, but two completely different interpretations of it. So explanation is the second thing you need, uh, second letter of C's, to answer questions about why and how. And there are lots of traps here. One is to move, jump directly, and we all do it, jump directly from the facts as you think them to what's going to ne happen next without the grounded explanation. Uh, it's like looking out of the window, the sun's shining, it's a gorgeous day. I remember yesterday was a gorgeous day, so tomorrow's going to be a gorgeous day. And statistically, you'll be right probably about 70% of the time, which is pretty good. But when you're wrong, you will be disastrously wrong because you had no idea that the front was moving in, you had no explanation of how the atmosphere was operating, and the th thunderstorm will sweep you away. So you have to test your explanations uh, against the data. In, the, in my trade, they, we tend to talk about hypotheses, but perhaps just talk about explanation. You should pick the explanation with the least evidence against it, not the explanation with the most evidence in favor of it, because of this bias. Any, you know, if you look hard enough, you can find evidence to support almost anything. And of course, that was one of the big traps in 2003 with the Iraq war. That's how conspiracies thrive because you are looking for evidence to support your theory, not for evidence that might discredit it. If you've got an open mind, then uh, 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 you ought to shift uh, to another explanation 
if you actually see uh, your favored explanation doesn't fit. And the lesson in intelligence here is therefore, you need a really sound evidence-based explanation. You need some data, and then you need a third element, which is where people trip up, which is you need to put some assumptions into the model. And again, we saw this in COVID, getting into real confusions, because the estimate of how COVID pandemic going to affect the NHS, for example, depended crucially on assumptions of the modelers about what will be compliance with mask wearing, what will be uh, the take up of the vaccine. And different groups made different assumptions, not surprisingly, <laughs> produced very different, uh, very different uh, estimates. So what I've been describing there is in the trade called Bayesian inference, and it gives you a way of trying to estimate the possible ways that events might unfold. Uh, and then you can say, on the assumption I take the decision this way or that way, you can begin to model, which is fine. But don't be surprised if they turn out to be wrong, because it's, a, it's an art, not a science. But, and that's the first three letters of my acronym C's. So situational awareness, explanation, uh, and estimation. But experience sadly shows that just when you've done all that and you're really settling down to take your decision, something completely unexpected comes and hits you on the back of the head. And that's the final S in C's, which is strategic notice. And that's not starting in the recent past and trying to project forward. That's using your imagination to go forward into the future and imagine and then work back to the present to ask yourself, well, if that were to happen, are the things I could do now which would help? So you think about your house blazing away, fire, you buy house insurance. Um, what would happen if China was the first nation to develop a workable quantum computer at scale? So that would give it the power to see all the world's encrypted communications, whether they're financial or military. Just work that one through. And then, you know, to the present, the policy implication is, well, we better double the amount of work that's going in to quantum resistant algorithms so we can still keep our secret secret, even if the Chinese get there first. They probably won't. The Americans will probably get there for first. But and this is another key lesson of intelligence, you don't just focus on the most likely outcome. You look at the range of possible outcomes and how serious it would be for all of us if they were to turn out to be true. So you have the, the, uh, that, that multiplication of the effect with how likely it is. And there are plenty of rather unlikely things which could happen. And one of the things you learn in the business is that even the most unlikely of things at some point is likely to happen. But strategic notice is answering questions like how could we best prepare for whatever might appear next? Uh, go to the science fiction writers uh, and ask them, imagine the, f the, near the future. And then think about, is that a future we want? And if it isn't, perhaps we should start investing now. And the obvious, obvious, obvious example of this is climate change. So if you acquire, you put effort into acquiring strategic notice and you use it, you don't have to be so surprised by surprise itself. Now, one of the advantages of unbundling decision-making in, in this kind of way, is that the ways you get it wrong for each of those four components are rather different. So uh, this is the substance of what's in the book about cognitive errors. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.